welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to another exciting episode of the Game Informer Show. That's right. This is the show where we inform you about games. Sometimes we inform ourselves. I'm your host, Ben Reeves, joined today by a big crew. We got Dan Tack. Hey, what's up, everybody? Uh, we got Alex Stadnick. No, we don't. Ben, Just we've kidding. been through this before. Alex Van Aiken. Van Aiken. I've been here for almost five months. Come on, man. Who can remember learn? one yeah. of the Alexes? Yeah. A non Alex as well, Andrew Reiner. Hello. Hello. And last but not least, Danny O'Dwyer, the newest hire at Game Informer. No, just kidding. Uh, no Cliff Flame. You probably know him and love him. Danny O'Dwyer, how's it going? Good. You can call me Alex if you want. I know you've already got two of them on staff. Um, but uh, one more. Just, yeah. Have, have everybody have on the team named Alex at this point? It'd just be so much easier for me. <laughs> Thanks for having me. It's, uh, yeah, super cool to be here. I've been a fan of the show and know lo loads of you guys for a long time and uh, haven't had the chance to catch up. So, yeah. Delighted yeah, to be well, here. We're welcome to have you. We we love your work. Obviously, you're doing some similar things, but obviously some different things over on NoClip. Maybe for people who aren't familiar, you want to just fill them in on, on kind of what you're doing. It's a lot of documentaries. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it, in many ways, it is probably like when it comes to like the mainstream press, you guys are probably the closest connection to anything that we would have done, uh, especially with all the cover story work you guys have done over the years. Um, but yeah, are we basically it's a it's a YouTube channel, uh, no clip, uh, youtube.com slash no clip video. And it's a, a channel that's full of long form, generally documentaries about games development. We mostly just go to studios kind of post release, you know, like six months to two years down the road from games coming out. And we talk to them about their process. And the whole idea is to kind of, uh, I guess, help gamers understand the process of games development a bit more. And also, perhaps in so doing, have a bit more empathy between developers and gamers. Um, and yeah, it's cool. We started four years and a half years ago. It's all crowd funded. There's no ads on the videos. Um, and it's mostly done by myself and uh, my camera dude, Jeremy Jane. And we, before this, flew around the world to talk to people. And now through the modern convenience of webcams, we now do it a little bit lo-fi. Um, <laughs> it, it, it used to be a lot more shooting B-roll in beautiful cities, so less of that at the moment. But, uh, do you think you'll be sticking with that form formula, or do you think you want to go back to visiting studios? Like, dude, I was I miss it so much. Like, we just wrapped up on a series on uh, Hades that we were we were sort of embedded with Supergiant for three and a half years, which was oh, wow. a, a good space to be because they're they're local. So mm -hmm. we could even during COVID, we did some interviews in people's back gardens. You know, when it was only thirty minutes or five minutes from my place here in Oakland. Um, but yeah, like realistically, and I, you guys must be thinking about this too, like when all of the like rea like normality or whatever starts coming back press tours are going to be <laughs> like right at the bottom right because like, imagine strangers coming into your office so people have to be in an office then you're inviting strangers in who've just been on a plane it's like not great that? no <laughs> so i'm not optimistic about this year yeah. maybe let's see about 2025 next yeah, <laughs> I was Can't never wait. scared to fly. I, I didn't mind flying. I kind of enjoyed it. But now I'm like nervous to get on a plane for very different reasons. Not because I'm miles in the sky, but <laughs> because yeah. I might die for other reasons. It's very it's, strange. It's a wild time. But yeah, you were lucky enough to like talk to the Hades guys. Did you notice a bump in those videos after the game oh, totally. 1.0 release? Dude. Because you were talking before anybody cared about it. Yeah, day and night. Yeah, the whole point was to cover the game through early access because like they'd never made an early access game, right? And their games are fairly like their games are the games they wanted to make like when they come out they are those games and some are more popular than others but they're all very much like their vision but they never done something where they were you know doing it with the players i guess so yeah like you said totally behind uh closed doors or in a sort of a little, little bubble uh and then when it came out like it's very fun because it's a series right the six episodes but the last episode has more views than almost the i think the only one that has more views is the first one huh so it's had so much time yeah because like people you know we could and we saw the older videos get a huge bump like after september 12th if you look at the youtube metrics it's like bunk um and that was really cool because then we had people who had just gotten the game and then binged on five episodes and then waited for our finale to come out but uh yeah that was a whole no one saw that coming the success they had last year that was like I mean, even I've always, always loved their games but yeah i don't i don't think i saw hades blown up the way it did and no. they deserve it 
Cool. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a that's a fun video game. Cool. Game of the year, some would say. Yes, some would say. Yeah. Okay. It was on our top ten. It's yeah, what was it? it? Yeah. What was your game of the year? Half Life Alex, dude. It's like okay. <laughs> it was like like the game I thought would never arrive. A we, like rather embarrassingly, one of our documentaries for the what was it the twentieth anniversary of Half Life Two coming out. We did because that was 2006, so 10th anniversary, sorry, God, not that old. We did a, we did just like a love letter to Half-Life. It was like an hour and 50 minute documentary, but Valve didn't reply to any emails. So we just did it anyway. And we interviewed like Corey Barlog and Jeff Keighley and all these other people, Vince Sampella. And we made like a, a fun video about the cultural influence of Half-Life. But the whole thing ends being like, shame we'll never get another Half-Life. And then Alex comes out and it's like, not only like, you know without talking about the story it's it's like it's a core half-life game and it's also like a really really good vr thing. it was the last thing i did in the studio was i had a room scale set up like 25 feet oh, by 25 that's cool feet. played that and then went went into quarantine but yeah. uh it's yeah. a good way to I, leave though <laughs> you needed that <laughs> space and and that's the best vr game yet and there hasn't been anything that's even close to it so you yeah. can abandon vr till the next one like, yeah just i was excited for that metal of honor box. I was excited for that Medal of Honor VR game and, and played that for a while. I was like, man, it just doesn't hold a candle to, uh, to Half-Life Alex, obviously. But yeah, what, what was that like? Because I saw the trailers and it looked interesting. That was that was uh, Sam Pella, wasn't it? Was that? Uh, um, it, it was Respawn. I don't know Respawn, how much yeah. Vince had to do with it. But mm. yeah, it was um, it was OK. I mean, it wasn't a bad game, but it was kind of it felt like if it had come out before I'd played Half-Life, maybe I would have given it more time because it was interesting to be in vr playing a shooter that was competent mm. but it, it it didn't really grab me you know they were definitely focused on story the story didn't grab me either right. was a lot of like short one thing that was kind of nice it was a lot of like short sandboxes like each level only took like five to ten minutes which was kind of oh nice. cool so Ooh, i don't know yes. if mm. somebody really wants a vr experience uh, it's there <laughs> we're checking out maybe <laughs> that's but the problem though, isn't it? first yeah, yeah, yeah like yeah, alex yeah. alex is like up here with them and I, you know, I like doing VR stuff just for the sort of five, 10 minute novelty of it. But yeah, Alex was its own beast. It's, yeah. Uh, after, after Half-Life Alex, I went on a VR purge, of, not purge, a uh, binge, I should say the opposite of a purge. <laughs> and, I was looking for another game that would grab me. I played like the climb and a couple other games and mm. some fun stuff, but yeah, it's hard to like, you know, when you play this big AAA experience to find something else like it, unfortunately. But anyway, Thanks for being here, Danny. Really appreciate it. We normally start the show with uh, what we like to call the playlist is where we talk about the games we've been playing. So let's kick that off. Dan, do you want to go first? Which Dan? Oh, <laughs> oh, sorry. That's right. I was talking about Dan Tech, our own very Dan Tech. Sir Dan Tech, I should say, right? I, I, not yet. I have, you know, in, in response to last week's, I did send that letter to the queen. I'm still waiting to hear back. <laughs> um, but we're working on that. But yes, I'm here, and uh, let's see. We got some cool stuff we can finally talk about this week, huh? Bravely Default 2. Mm. Who likes RPGs? <laughs> the, this is the sequel. The first one came out on the 3DS. It's actually, it's actually the third game. It's actually, the third game. it's actually the third game. Yeah, there was a Bravely Second as well, which oh, is yeah. not Bravely Default right. 2. Um, this is the third game in this sort of very old school take on 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 rpgs uh, this is this is a very strange game to talk about um as a critic because basically i think you pretty much already know if you're gonna like this game before you touch it um just by the you know they made some very small changes in this one compared to some of the uh, other versions i guess um and we'll talk about compared those compared to because it looks like just from a distance it looks like i don't know final fantasy 9 does that seem like a fair comparison no let's go back let's go back to final <laughs> fantasy 5 ish Really, even that's, that's, really, well, that's just, really visually, it's still in 3D though. It's not like visually, strange. visually, this gameplay actually, wise, visually is one of the dissonant chords of this particular game. Actually, the sort of chibi bobblehead characters really don't mesh well with the environments. So mm -hmm. compared to something that's modern and, and beautiful like Octopath Traveler, the the visuals really didn't capture me on this one. Uh, hmm. the, the environments, some of the environments and the dungeons are very well done, but in general, like the characters, not so much. But um, so the core of it, you grind monsters, you advance your jobs, and you, you combine those jobs in, in interesting ways. Like, you can make a build where, okay, so I have a skill that attacks everybody with my, with my basic attack. What if I combine that with a chance to hit double on basic attacks? And then 
steal on a basic attack. And then, you know, you just create this like overpowered mix of, you know, lawnmower grinding machines that just like <laughs> eat experience and gold and just go th- just hundreds and hundreds of monsters at a time. And then you fight a boss, which is going to be in general in this game, pretty overpowered. And you're going to have to try to figure out how to balance your jobs to figure out how to take that boss down. Maybe the boss like counters all melee attacks. So maybe you should think about using magic on that fight and check your magic jobs and see how they interact, all that kind of fun stuff. But it's very formulaic, very old school, very, this is the dungeon. There's a save point behind, behind for the boss. You beat the dungeon. You go to another dungeon. There's a save point. You fight the boss. And so on and so forth through many different jobs and unlocks. Um, if this sounds cool to you, you're in the right place. This is this is very this is very much an ode to old school Final Fantasies. If you're not familiar with the series, like we're talking one, two, three, four, five ish, um, right? The very old ones. Not don't play this game for the story. Don't play it for character development. Don't play it for dialogue. None of these things are going. To, these may be a minus a minus category. Okay, for this. They're that game. bad. The story is that bad. I there are. Yeah, we're not. The story is not good, uh, <laughs> and, and the dialogue is worse. But if you're the p- kind of person who wants these systems and mechanics, these sort of job, you know, job classes, mixing and matching, finding the right items, like creating dual wielding whatevers, right? You can do all kinds of mixing and matching and creating your stuff. And they have added some cool exploration elements to the game. Uh, you do get these, these giant sort of open world areas with multiple dungeons, rare monsters to go and hunt down, special items and stuff to do during the journey. I know some players were very concerned going into this title that they were really upset that you couldn't turn enemy random fights off. So the enemies are on the map. You see what you're going to fight. Like, you know, they're walking around. Mm -hmm. But if you're stronger than the opponent, the the creatures, they'll run away from you. So you don't ever have to fight them. Mm -hmm. I went through like seven or eight dungeons without even fighting a single monster. Once I got, once my party was fully locked and loaded, you know? So you still have that option, that option to never fight unless you're grinding. And then you have the option to use things called monster treats to do four fights in a row so that when you want to grind, you're grinding. And then when you're not grinding, you're fighting bosses. It's a very, very core systems and mechanics kind of meat game. OK, like for well, somebody who likes those systems, though, you must dig that at least. I did. I like that stuff. Uh, it's right in line with the other Bravely games. You know, they didn't really try anything. That I, they very, very small, subtle changes. But if you like the other Bravely games, you'll probably like this one. And if you didn't, you probably won't like this either. So <laughs> you need right not apply. Mind. Yeah. You know, I compared to like something like Octopath, I think I liked Octopath more, but they because just the visuals and stuff blow me away on that game. And it's got the same kind of hearkening back to those old days of JRPGs. But yeah, in terms of creating an old school JRPG experience in today's world, I think this succeeds. And you can check sure. out the full review at gameinformer.com. Oh, do you know what you're giving it yet? Yeah, it's it's getting an eight. Solid eight. Okay. Oh, that wow. sounds like a good score for fans of the series. Again, I, I as I say in the in the review, this game has elements that I enjoy. I'm a super nostalgia head for those old games, and I'd rather play them than modern Final Fantasies. So take that in consideration when you yeah. uh, make the choice. Sure. You've been playing anything else you're eager to talk about? I can talk all day, Ben. But uh, uh, let's Rogue Heroes, Ruins of Talos, that just came out. Oh yeah, um, this is doing good the, things. Uh, yeah. Zelda roguelike four player thing. You got it. I'm only a couple hours in, but uh, Rogue Light, very Rogue Lighty. So this mm-hmm. is okay. This is if you took Stardew Valley, combined it with Rogue Legacy and The Legend of Zelda. So three great tastes all in one meal, right? Um, I haven't tried out the multiplayer yet, but the Rogue Light ele- the Rogue Light elements are very strong. Like you get really strong in this game. It's not like you know um, Dead Cells where you kind of progress laterally mm-hmm. with some big abilities. This is like you get really strong. You get like crit damage and power and you're just punching monsters that beat you in the last run. So you're just, and you got all, all those old tools, you know, you got boomerangs, grappling hooks, bombs. It's straight up inspired by Zelda for the dungeon uh, creation. Yeah, I heard they even have some like multiplayer, you know, even though it's like procedurally generated dungeons, they do some multiplayer puzzles. So you're solving puzzles together, which mm-hmm. sounds really cool. Kind of four yeah. swordsy a little bit, yeah. Yeah, puzzles in a rogue like is interesting because yeah, when you say Zelda, I think of dungeon puzzles. Like that's the main thing in that series that I love, and I can't imagine even when Zelda's tried to do it, m- multiplayer puzzles it doesn't quite work out as well. So I can't imagine in a rogue like experience they would 
they would nail that aspect. But what do you think of the puzzles? So I haven't tried the multiplayer puzzles yet, just the single player. And so the way it's constructed is like, you know, so the dungeon, the overworld is static, but the dungeons are procedurally generated. So you might get puzzle room C, for instance, and you'll know that puzzle, right? It's not like you're going to get completely thrown for a loop. They have to have some rules for the for the Zelda archetype to work in there. Yeah. It's not just trying to formulate, make craft a puzzle out of elements. Like puzzle room XYZ7 is always going to be that puzzle. So you'll, you'll recognize it on site. Um, but... It, the, the dungeons are very, very Zelda. Like, they feel like going through a Zelda dungeon, you know, throwing boomerangs, blowing up walls with your bombs, finding the map, and getting the boss key door, all that fun stuff. It's all there. Um, I think, you know, again, only a few hours in, but very much enjoying it so far. We'll see if it can carry through the whole experience. And also, got to test out the multiplayer as well, eager to do that. Cool. Cool. Uh, let's see. Uh, Andrew Reiner, you also yeah, yeah, yeah. this week. Yeah. So I played, uh, man, going back to 1991, basically, uh, Ghosts and Goblins Resurrection. Look at Danny. <clears throat> yeah. I, I've heard differing things on this. Well, it's a hard game to like just even play in 2021, right? Because that game was murderously difficult when it came out. It was. It was kind of like the first, well, not the first. There was a lot of games back then that would just, you know, first eat your soul. Game. Uh, yeah. but it was, uh, Dark Souls. It, it, yeah, I mean, kind of, you know, in, in terms of the design of, you know, the, the character and the enemies, there's, there's a lot of shared similarities there, but, uh, yeah, just a brutally difficult game. And this is such a nice love letter to Super Nintendo gaming. Like I, within minutes of playing felt like, you know, I, I had just purchased Ghouls and Ghosts again, or Super Castlevania four, you know, just kind of experiencing this this, you know, kind of heyday of action, right? Like where they were really starting to explore new spaces. And this game, the, the thing it does so well, not in, in terms of just kind of rekindling that fire, uh, it is so creative in its flow of action where every checkpoint you hit, they change up what you're doing next. Yet you're still using that very basic move set of just running and jumping, you know, and it's you got to be very careful when you're jumping because you're not moving in the air. It's like once you commit to hitting that jump button, you know where you're going, right? Uh, in a pit or right on the edge of a, a ledge. And then also just being able to throw in four directions. You know, that's all you're doing in this game is, is throwing that lance, hopefully hitting an enemy, you know, at a great distance, which opens up a running lane for you. But what they do from checkpoint to checkpoint will challenge you in different ways. And I, I thought it was so clever and, and nicely designed in how it's paced and then just how they surprise you, you know, like you'll go from sliding on ice in one section to going into a cave. That's just teeth that are, you know, m this giant maw that you're in that you have to be careful of. Not only are you navigating dangers within the space, but if you jump too high, you're hitting the teeth, you get hurt and the, you know, the mouth is moving. So you got to like plan for the, 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 basically the frame of the game, uh, to move at the right time to allow you to, to navigate the space. Uh, I just think it's a great game. It, it's got the same director that made the original Ghosts and Goblins. Fujiwara really? is back. Wow. Yeah. That so he's come cool. back. So this is like the third entry. There was, you know, Ultimate Ghosts and Goblins on PSP. There was a couple iOS games, but this is like a true sequel to that 1991 game, Ghouls and Ghosts. And I adored those games back then. And, and here's another cool thing. It's brutally hard, and it has that kind of Dark Souls quality. Alex played it the other day, and it was, you just it get was, wrecked, uh, wrecked, torturous. wrecked. <laughs> but it has the modern sensibilities to tell you, like, okay, you're getting wrecked. Hey, lower the difficulty. Do you want to change the difficulty? You could do that. You know, you get an extra piece of armor, right? Or, or the enemies aren't as aggressive. They also have something called the magic metronome in the game that allows you to slow it down. Yeah, that was really It gives cool. you an edge. So if you're doing platforming across, you know, crumbling platforms, you get an extra second, you know, like mm -hmm. you really kind of like, not only just breathe, but just kind of be more precise in your movement. Uh, if you want it harder, for, if for whatever reason, you just think this game's too easy, you could once you beat the game, you could speed up the metronome as well. So it's like moving at lightning speeds. I don't know how you'll, there'll probably be videos that come out years from now or months from now where people are just wrecking this game at, at the highest speed. You can also uh, hook up another Joy-Con and have a, uh, a friend join you. And kind of like Mario Galaxy, you're not playing true co-op. The second player is controlling these ghosts. 
So you're not the second player is not getting the the true experience of the game. You're not you know getting crushed. You're kind of invincible, but you do help your friend. So you play as these three ghosts that you can rotate through. One of them will create a protective shield around your friend who's playing as Arthur. Uh, another one will put you can create a bridge, a ghostly bridge that you can run across a gap that maybe is giving you troubles. And then the third one can pick you up, uh, which and carry you uh, a short distance, which again allows you to get across a gap, but also allow you to shoot at a higher vantage point if you need if you're taking on a boss with you know that that's a giant or something like that. You can you can kind of spam them that way. Um, and the the lowest difficulty, by the way, if you just want to breeze through this game, is called page the page difficulty, and that will allow you to respawn right where you die. So. Oh. You know, it, it's basically just like a speed run through the game then. Wow. Is there uh, unlimited lives in this version? Uh, yeah, yeah. So that, that version... Don't keep putting quarters in or... <laughs> <laughs> right. It, it's, it has that difficulty that is like the arcade essence, right? Where it's like, we want to crush you in a minute and have you put in another quarter. <laughs> you know, in our 20-minute gameplay demo that we did with, with Alex, he died 20 times, right? Like, so a, a death a minute is kind of like the rate that you're going in this game. Um and then true to the old games is the last bit I'll, I'll go into is once you beat it, it rearranges the levels, uh, you know, makes them more nightmarish. There's different challenges in it. So this is a game that you want to play multiple times to see all of the content. I adored it. I gave it a nine out of 10. I, you know, I was a fan of the games growing up and this just felt like, you know, I was right back there as, as a kid again, playing uh, one of my favorite Super Nintendo games. Did I going to play some sort of like skill tree? Sorry, man. Oh, you're fine, yeah, you're fine. there is. Yeah, yeah. So you, as you're going through the levels, you're getting uh, umbral bees. It's a very strange currency that you collect, bees. but they're kind of flying around. So you got to like, not only are you navigating dangers, but you got to try to get these bees before they disappear. Uh, and it, they're time based, right? Like you cannot just like wait for it. You got to like, I got to get that bee right now and, and go get it. But you exchange those for different magic powers. Uh, you can rain down lightning, uh, turn all the enemies on screen into a frog. You know, that you could just kind of run past. That sounds cool. Uh, One frog? Uh, all the enemies turn into frogs, <laughs> okay. yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, there's there's a lot there, and that's a reason to play through the game again, right? Like, to get to max out that tree, the umbral tree, they call it, and and just see all of, of the different mechanics that are at play. And it, all of it's pretty clever, and it works really well with, with the uh, the level designs. Was that a thing in the, the SNES game where you had to beat it twice to get the true ending? Yeah, I think you had to go through it without getting hit. Oh my god! Yeah, I think there was like a flawless run to see the true, true ending. Wow. Yeah. Could you imagine if somebody did survive. that the, these days? Imagine like they should people. do it in like a Dark Souls. They should do that in like the next Dark Souls or Elden Ring. <laughs> They're probably the only people that would get away with doing that. Yeah, uh, you're people totally like, right. Crop software, do whatever you want when it comes. And to people would be like, brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Redefines games. Uh. <laughs> Yeah, I saw this on Twitter. I think it was Twitter the other day where, you know, when you get hit, you get stripped down to your underwear in the game. Mm -hmm. And I, everybody always thought they were hearts. I thought they were hearts anyway. And it turns out they're strawberries, which did you guys know this? The I always pattern thought they were hearts. Is a strawberry yeah. pattern. So the Maximo games made them hearts. Capcom USA even thought they were hearts you know so they had the US development teams make it and they were like, yeah, let's just like sell the the heart boxer shorts as, as an item, you know, like that people can get if they're fans of Maximo. But then, you know, yeah, Fujiwara comes back. He's like, no, no, no. They're strawberries. Strawberries are better than hearts. <laughs> Come on, everyone. Strawberries taste good. Uh, yeah, I was going to bring up Maximo, too. I remember that game. I really like that game. It should, it should bring back a Maximo resurrected. I'd yeah, that. 3D platformer. Yeah, just keep Arthur alive. Yeah, this I love this game. I hope it I hope it gets embraced. I hope people find it and and uh and see like what it's really about. I know it's kind of getting uh, polarizing reviews, but uh, you know, it's an acquired taste for sure. But if, if you can latch onto it, wow, it'll take you for a ride. It's it's good fun. Awesome. Well, like you said, the reviews on the site you said give it a nine. So nine out of ten. Yep. Game. Check it yeah. out. Yeah. Yep. Anything else In, you want to uh, talk about? Switch right? exclusive. Yeah, I'm also playing a lot of Fortnite with my daughter. Nice. So and and the only thing I want to say is like we're playing the hell out of this. We're doing pretty well getting victory rails. But I was in a meeting yesterday, you know, a, a, a Zoom meeting, and she comes walking in and slides me a note. And I put this on Twitter, and it says, "Hi, Dad, I'm level seventy three in Fortnite." And I'm like, "Oh, that's great." And then it says, and then she changes the color ink from blue to red. And then in the red, it says, "I bought my way there." 
Smiley face, yay. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm in this meeting and I'm just like, white as a ghost, like, oh no, like, are the child settings off? Was she, is she just like maxing out my credit card, buying V bucks? <laughs> oh no. But uh, not too right much away. happened. She she got twenty bucks worth of, of V bucks, okay. right. and then okay. used that to buy levels. And uh, yeah, oh, but God. still, it's like okay, got to put the child locks back on. <laughs> <laughs> it was written in red ink. Is <laughs> like yeah? I mean, seriously, it's like on Twitter. It's it's hilarious. Killer. Yeah, oh, it's one of those things I'm going to look back at and be like, oh, she's adorable, but also like a fair warning to all parents out there. Too. Uh, <laughs> That's terrifying. Keep an eye on the gaming. Yeah, my kid is, she's only like, she's not even three yet. And she's like, we've been playing a bit of bug snacks this week. And she's like sitting on my lap and loves the story. And I, I've just realized I've like set myself up now for this, this future of having to parental lock everything. Yeah, I would say about age five. Five and a half, six. That's where it's really going to kick in for gaming. Okay. That's where she's just like, this is my favorite thing ever. And she wants to play everything she can get her hands on. I always wondered if they like, you know, repel. Like, you know, you try and run away from what your parents do as much as possible. Yeah. Like, will she be super into like rock climbing or something? Because I'm, because I don't like do any of that sort of Video stuff. Video games. Oh, that's nerdy stuff. Yeah. Gosh, you're such a loser, game. dad. So she did that with Star Wars. She thinks Star Wars is really dumb. You know, like she's just like, I don't want to have anything to do with that. But we share the similar passion for uh, for games, which awesome. is which is good. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's my career. And and now I get to share, you know, that time with her, which is fantastic. Hopefully that happens to you, too. That's cool. Yeah. It's, it's wonderful being able to, you know, turn off the computer at work and then just go and relax and play games with her. Yeah, share what a hobby. Thing for you guys when you were kids, were your parents into anything? You were like, oh, that's nerdy dork. Like, I remember my grandfather being really into Westerns and I thought Westerns were super boring. And now <laughs> I'm like, oh, Westerns are actually kind of cool, but. I was in a weird spot where both sides of my family, because my family split up, um, my grandpa and my dad and I would sit down like routinely once a week and play starcraft 2 and warcraft tides of darkness whoa and just play oh, like so, cool. and like grandpa would be on on the, on the mouse and keyboard and we'd just be watching like critiquing him and like just backseat gaming and then on the flip side my mom's side of the family my at one point my entire family my mom my stepdad my brother we all played world of warcraft together whoa and, uh, and city of heroes yeah it was like it was a phenomenal time of my life that unfortunately, you know, it's a little hard to wrangle the whole family these days to, you know, dive into Valheim or whatever. But <laughs> yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty cool. Did you have that moment in life where you realize like, oh, not every grandma plays games. <laughs> oh, almost every time I bring up those stories, somebody's like, my parents hated me and hate games. And I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. That sucks. That's but, wild. I yeah. can't believe that. Yeah. My mom's the one who really helped me get into like Halo 2 multiplayer, like, it's it was a it was an interesting childhood, very cool childhood, but interesting nonetheless. Jeez, yeah, yeah. My, my parents didn't touch. Ireland is like you go back two generations in Ireland, and it's you know the stories of my grandmother, you know, living in a bloody house made of peace. You know what I mean? Like it's like you go back two gen. Like I'm the first. We're the first generation who went to college. Like hmm. all that sort of stuff. So it's like my parents never played a game. In their lives until and they taught like i wasn't allowed to play games when i was a kid only on weekends um for until i eventually just saved up enough money and bought my own machine and they couldn't do anything anything about it <laughs> stuck in my room but i remember my dad was like one time the one time he ever was like interested in what i was doing with games was um i was playing assassin's creed one and he'd been to the holy land because my uncle was a, a un peacekeeper and he was over there but they'd, they'd visited a bunch of times and i was like climbing the cathedral in Damascus or something. And he was just like fascinated. It was like, this is what, and he's like, this is set back then. Yeah. And he sat down and watched for like 20 minutes. And that was the only time he's ever even glanced at it. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. You should get him to check out that history tour stuff they've been doing in the recent. I know. And in, in the, it, that's in the, the Egyptian one, right? And I think, well, so, I yeah. think they've been doing it because they're Origin, just going to yeah. roll it out with uh, the new one here soon. I think they're going to do the You're right. Viking one here pretty soon. Yeah, there's not enough Viking games out at the moment. I'll jump back into <laughs> <Yeah>. that. <laughs> we talked about that last thing. Yeah. yeah, it's it's yeah, my uh, Lost Vikings got announced too. yesterday too, right? Or two days ago? Yeah, yeah. The, well, yeah. Network. I mean, speaking of Vikings, Valheim. I know Alex, you wanted to talk about that. You've yeah, been about that. that game is uh, intoxicating. Yeah. I don't know. It's uh, Dan made me. It didn't make me. Dan helped me and guided me through on a on a live stream last week and kind of showed me the ropes and then. 
ever since. That's like pretty much all I've been thinking about uh, when I'm when I'm working, when I'm when I'm sleeping. It's Valheim. And uh, last night, actually, my buddy uh, Jesse uh, over at Prima Games, uh, he, we've been like building out our base and everything. And we decided to build like this elaborate gatehouse that, you know, uh, we have like a path leading to the spawn uh, with all these torches and everything. And uh, he was like, what if we what if we tried to put like a long boat inside of the gatehouse and like really make it like Viking as hell? And we spent about three hours last night like meticulously adding poles and rafters to our building so that we could like perfectly situate the boat inside of uh, our gatehouse. And we did it. And I was like, damn, this game is uh, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> it's just, yeah. Awesome. Uh, as far as like building goes, like they kind of give you like, you know, it's, it's nothing different from, you know, other survival games in terms of like crafting, but I don't know, just something about like having that fantasy realized while also getting to do that stuff. Like it's just, it's a lot of fun, man. So that's pretty much what I've been playing. I've only beaten the first boss because I've spent all of my time building my base, but you know, but you gotta, you gotta go beat some of the other ones so you can get some, you think your base is cool now. Just oh, wait I know. So you can build later. <laughs> I've seen some stuff on Reddit that I definitely need to make some progress. I want to make like some, some stone towers. Uh, I'm excited. Is it looks like the, the cause I've played like we've a bunch this week as well, but it, we, I don't know if the second boss was just far from us or something, but we've done loads, but the jump between the first and second boss seems like quite a lot. Is there another boss in it? Have they done all the five things? There, or? there are five core bosses available now. There yeah. are. Wow. God, they're for an early access game. There's so much meat on this boat. Yeah. It's there crazy. Is. It's a dev team of five. Apparently. Yes. And they're okay. The we're, we're we're five people here. If we sold like five million <laughs> copies, would we even finish that game, or we'd just be like, <laughs> we're going car shop and we're done. And how would we ever finish it? They have four. <laughs> they got uh, what four more biomes to do and a bunch of other stuff before release. So wow. that's wild. Uh, I think that's, that's called George R. R. Martin itis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, big expectations. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, that game is so much fun. I've been in the same boat. I've been playing. A bunch of it with a, a bunch of my friends back home it's kind of like our our game to play to keep in touch at the moment it's yeah. just the fantasy football just stopped so we needed something else to do um yeah it's so much fun i just there's always something to do and, and even like the simple pleasures in that game work really well like hunting is fun because like even yeah. just having a bit of a dip on the arrow like just it's something to problem solve and think about cutting down trees you're you know you're trying to like line it up so you can hit multiple trees with the same axe swing and like every it's just it's one of those games with like the more plates to get added in with like you know you've got your bees or if you're farming or if you're trying to get making stuff out of copper all the problem solving that's going on in your brain all the time and like that like satisfaction loop is just like it's i'm trying to like think about other games that have felt that way it like reminds me almost like the simpler version is kind of like World of Warcraft where you just have yeah. like lists of things you're working on and quests. And then you're also leveling your character and doing this. And then there's a social aspect of it. There's just so mm -hmm. much like going on, but on a systems level, just, it's just so fun. Like one thing can happen and it like you're suddenly you're shagged like like a dom <laughs> the dominoes start falling and you're like, wait a second. And you think like five <laughs> steps ahead and you're like, we had, a, we had a moment where um, a bunch of us were on a boat trying to get to where the second boss apparently was. And uh, one of the guys went AFK and then we started getting uh, something in the ocean started to scare us. So we tried to find land again and then beached it, started getting attacked because we were outside a forest. And then we didn't realize that if there's someone in the boat, the boat doesn't, because if you get out of the boat and leave it there, it just kind of stays where it is. And we were fighting all these things. And our buddy, who's AFK, is oh, no. floating off. <laughs> and we're like, like sc screaming on Discord, like, come back, come back, come back. And then he comes back and he's like, where are you? And he's off, you know, we're just saying, come back quick before the thing gets you. It's just like, yeah, everything is fine until it's not. And then the whole, yeah. everything is just a nightmare. It's so, it's, like, it's so I'll cool. be fine. I'm just on a boat. Yeah. And I feel like they, they dole it all out in a really smart way because I've played sunny, plenty of survival games where it's just, you're overwhelmed, like from, from, from the jump. And it's like, it's smart because like, okay, I'm picking up this piece of copper. Now the recipes for that, that ingredient open mm -hmm. up to me and so on and so forth. And it's kind of like that carrot on the stick without, you know, being like, oh my gosh, I've got 60 things that I can craft here. You know, I feel like it's like kind of bit by bit and it's just, yeah, it's been really fun. Even, and even the, just the combat having 
like a bit more, you know, it's not like it's not like Dark Souls, but it has a, a functional parry system in it, which yeah. especially when you start to get into like, you know, the sort of fourth and fifth biome, um, because we accidentally found ourselves in the last one and there's something in there <laughs> that can kill you in basically one shot and killed us like two hours from our base. It was <laughs> took like two days to get back there. Um uh having that I does turn it into like it it's not like a game where like in WoW, for instance, um, where you know, Duskwood is right there. And so you kind of wait until you're in the level and then get to it. And then you're just like hitting mobs again, right? It's just like yeah. you're controlling, you know, your health basically. And there's a bit of like stamina control in this, but generally, you know, when you're fighting some of the higher level, I don't want to spoil stuff, but like when you're going into places and, and fighting enemies, like you are thinking about like parrying and your stamina and what type of food you're making for your stamina regen. So, but it's not too deep either. You're not like getting lost in the weeds in it. It's like everything is just deep enough, but not too crazy. But there's so much of it going on that it's just, yeah, it's wild. I want to know what these people made before this. Like anything? Or See, did they just nail it? Iron yeah. Gate Studio. No, this is the first game. Wow. But yeah, individually, I wonder who these yeah. devs are. Yeah. Like what's their, their history? Seems Do we like think this game has staying power, by the way? Not right so now. Be like Fall Guys or... It, it will oh, fit yeah. when it's done. Certainly, like the thing is, like yeah. I, I can't, I can't wait for. It. I talked about this a little bit last week. There's going to be this big, when everybody hits the content wall and finishes it, and people will stop streaming it. People are going to be like, "Oh man, dead game!" <laughs> Just a flash in the pan. It's like, well, it's not the full game. They're going to be working on it for like another year, right? Like, it, it'll, it'll be back. There's, there's a lot of really good hooks in this one. Again, yeah, it really distills survival elements into nice packages for people to enjoy. And I think that's one of the big differences between that and some of the other more hardcore survival games out there, which are like, yeah, you're going to die. It's like, yeah, well, what if I didn't die? What if I got to like enjoy a sunset and just, you know, kill a boar? That's <laughs> fun too. Yeah, well said. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah 87,000 reviews on Steam and it's at wow. a 96. Yeah. People love it. Crazy. Quite good. Yeah, Amazing. I know Dan. You wrote a bunch of stuff on Valheim, like guides and stuff on the site. So if people want to read more about that, they should definitely check those out for sure. You have one you want to highlight in particular? You know, f given most of the comments that came last week, I would I would recommend the "What is Valheim and why is everyone playing it?" By the way, everyone does not literally mean everyone in the entire world. Okay, <laughs> it's, I'm using it to encompass a large group of players. Thanks for clarifying, Dan. My mom's I, you, you, you have to, Alex. You have to. <laughs> Yeah, I remember calling my parents out on that a lot when I was five. So <laughs> I feel you. Uh, cool. Well, yeah, that's Valheim. Uh, I don't know, Danny or Alex, did either of you guys have another game you want to talk about? Totally fine. That's it for me this week. Yeah, Valheim all day. I'm just full-time Viking when I'm not on podcasts. Yeah, fair enough. One game I wanted to call out and highlight is a game called Olia. I believe it's yeah. pronounced O-L-I-J-A is how it's spelled. Mm -hmm. I heard our friends over at MinMax talking about it. And it sounded kind of cool. It's this like side-scrolling platformer action game. It's got a very simple pixel art aesthetic. But yeah. one thing that I really appreciated is how much they do with that pixel art. Even though it's really simple looking, they do a really good job of setting an atmosphere. Really good sound design, I think, in that game. Uh, it's a little bit of a slow start, but it's not super long. You pick up the spear pretty early on. And the coolest part of the game is you can throw the spear across the screen and then zip to it. So if you like throw it at an enemy and stab them, you can like immediately like teleport over to your spear and then continue the fight. And they use it for puzzle solving and stuff too. So yeah, we cool. gave yeah, that a, uh, we gave that an 8.5 out of 10. That was Marcus yeah. Stewart. Marcus um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was kind of like I a mark of it. the ninja or not mark of the ninja. Um, what's the other one? What's that? Uh, samurai gun is that what i'm thinking of that kind of aesthetic to it like the graphics are super stripped back yeah i didn't play the samurai gun game but i can see what you're talking about it's definitely oh, no. yeah, very i'm not thinking of samurai gun what's the one nidhog that's what i'm thinking of. oh, oh there yeah. you go yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 all right the first yeah. one for sure yeah very oh yeah god the second that. one looked nothing like the first one, <laughs> <laughs> the one looked weird mine is a trippy thing yeah a little out of this world to it too the way yeah, the characters I, move yeah I heard people compare it to like the first prince of persia like the original mm. one the 2d one and i could kind of see that as well it's got it's got a story that's pretty interesting i haven't finished it yet to be fair but i'm curious to see where it's going so they kind of tell yeah, it in an interesting and really stylized way too like 
it's almost like at certain points, you know, you're you're watching like a film. Like there's so many cut to blacks in in this this game. It's it's pretty funny, especially when it's kind of paired with that pixel art aesthetic. But I dig it. It's cool. It's got a subtle. It's not really like a horror game, but it's got kind of that like ominous tone to yeah, it. Yeah, it's eerie happening. Yeah, it's very eerie, which I I definitely dig that vibe. Yeah. So yeah, worth checking out if you want. Olia, like Reiner said, you can check out the review on the site. Well, yeah, that closes off the playlist for the day. So I think we should probably move on. You guys want to take a break? We'll do some emails. Sounds good. Great. We'll be right back. All right. Welcome back, everyone, to the Game Informer Show. And we're here to answer a few emails. These are emails that people send in, podcast at GameInformer.com. Send us anything you want. Honestly, you can send a shopping list or whatever. But we prefer good, (laughs) solid questions. We also love games. You can send us characters rank on our ever expanding list of characters. But this week, we got a few great emails. We have Zach from Tulsa writing in. He says, with the recent announcement of NCAA football from EA coming back sometime in the future, and Joe Joe was talking a couple weeks ago about wanting to play a robotic quarterback football game, which is <laughs> surprising coming from Joe, but he references that, like Joe referenced wanting to play that game. So he says the last NCAA game came out at a peak gaming time for me in college. So while we were playing the games with the players, we were watching. So we were playing games with players that we were also watching on TV on the weekends, and it made it so much more exciting. That being said, my friends and I often tried to break the game by doing some ridiculous stuff. As we played through a season, we would all be on the same team and every single play was a Hail Mary. <laughs> and every time we scored, we'd go for an onside kick. Because of this, our total lack of defense skills would have games going up to be 120 to 75 sometimes, which is just <laughs> ridiculous. Uh, the commentators would mock us and say we were unsportsmanlike, but honestly, it was a real blast. So do you guys have any games that you've played, quote unquote, the wrong way because it was more fun? I got one. Uh, this one still haunts me to my day to this day in my gaming clan. Uh, my buddy Phil, we played Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 together, and we'd go running into battle. We're playing Team Deathmatch. We go running into battle, and all of a sudden he'd yell first. And we're like, what the heck? And he's like, I'm the first to die. And we're like, <laughs> what, what is what is this? And you know, we're all kind of laughing. But then it became a thing <laughs> where we're all running to be the one to yell first. And it would it would get it get to a point where it was like he would die and then I would die and then another friend would die. And it's like we're already down, you know, zero three in our match, you know, like. <laughs> and so every time we game with him, it's it's like in the back of your mind when 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 he dies, you're you're waiting for him to say first or, you know, someone to say it. And we get back in this vicious loop of not playing, the, you know, putting ourselves at a very bad advantage point, you know, like leading into the match. <laughs> This Just would not for, work in Counter Strike. Yeah, like we, it'd be, you'd be done. But it was it was such a fun thing. And then you know the rest of the match, we were really trying, and we really valued our our K to D. But for whatever reason, right right when it started, it's like I want to be the first to die, and it would just be us running, you know, just not even shooting the guns, just running right into the enemy ranks. And uh, yeah, that is the worst way you could play a multiplayer game, by the way. And and we did that all through Modern Warfare Two. That's, That's amazing. Fantastic. I like that. Would you ever have games where you like dug yourself into a hole and then you came back and won? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Or you'd lose by one and then you're like going back to that <laughs> first death. That. You're like, come on. Oh, no. <laughs> That's a killer. We used to, I used to do one with, with some friends that was a sports game. Uh, I used to play FIFA with my buddies and we're all sort of, you know, of a relatively similar skill. But then I had one friend who wasn't really into them. So we invented this game called Murder Ball, which was uh, if you got a player sent off, you got a goal. Um, so it became this sort of like asymmetric game where they're getting players, they're tackling you all over the place and getting goals, but then they have fewer players. So it's easier to score against them. Um, so it was it was always like very tactical of like, when do you get your players sent off? Which players do you get sent off? Like you try and get your striker <laughs> sent off if you're not going to be going to score. Or like, you know, it's really close at the end and then suddenly I've got more players that I can get, I can start doing slide tackles all over the place, whereas he's only got like six, seven players left or whatever. Um, and also there's like a limit, like I forget what it is, but like in official soccer rules, I think if you have like five players sent off, the match is abandoned. So you also <laughs> like, you have to like run up against that one as well. So yeah, we used to play that forever. 
Which one was that again? Oh, it was back. It was one of the FIFAs, but they've basically been the same for 20 years, for 10 years. So like, do you maybe, remember the system? Oh, it, it was, would have been probably 360 we're playing on. This was, okay. yeah, this was like not that long ago. Um, yeah, it was, uh, because, and they never really added in any like interesting takes on football, on soccer until the more recent ones where they added in, there's like a, there's like a no rules version and then there's one where you have to score with either headers or volleys which is a, sort of a classic school ground game that you play a mm. uh, football so they have added in some like variants which is cool but obviously not the one where you get goals for harming people <laughs> that's amazing yeah the only instance of something like this i could think of was playing sonic the hedgehog i think it was two and three me and my brother would play that a ton after school and it got to the point where we'd beaten it so many times we're just like trying to like play it and add new rules to yourself so we definitely played a couple times where tails was like the main hero in our mind and <laughs> sonic couldn't attack anybody and so tails had to do all the work and sonic was just following behind or like sometimes it would be like you would walk slowly forward and try to have tails like kill everything so t otherwise sonic was going to get hit you know <laughs> Like that kind of stuff we would do. It was it was fun. That's wild. Was there any limit to the amount of work Tails would do? Not really. I mean, the funny thing was like, you know, the joke was like, you know, Sonic would always run so fast that Tails would get left behind and disappear. Right. So like playing as Tails was never fun. So I think it was like, well, how can we make playing as Tails more fun? Oh, huh. Okay. Right. So Tails would like just kill all the enemies. And if it ever got to a loop that... Sonic had to go fast by. Tails will like pick him up and carry him over that stuff like that. There was Sega like, needed you for testing. Like yeah. you guys could have made that game better. <laughs> There's some ideas for you guys. Call me, please. You, you still need help. <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, I don't really have too many. It would have been Halo Two. We would play like just public games, me and my friends. But when we would load into a big map um, or even a small one like Lockout, we would just play like hide and seek. And try to stay away from the enemy team as long as possible. Uh, and yeah, it was just kind of the goal was to burn the timer of the match before they got to their their top kills. So it was a miserable experience for whoever we played with, but it was fun for us. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, that's fun. Yeah, there's the stuff. I don't think this is really in the spirit of the question, but like in Halo, where you would turn the gravity way down and like oh, yeah. play yeah. with explosives. Like that's obviously just good, clean fun. Yeah. Yeah, I missed that in Counter Strike. You'd obviously get, you know, scouts' knives and all of these weird variants. And then it went in the total opposite direction, you know, the jump maps and surfing and all that yeah. nonsense. But yeah, there is something to be said about making your own fun that we don't get so much yeah. these days, perhaps, like we used to. Not to be all rose tinted glasses about it, but I do miss some of the modding, um, you know, nonsense we used to get like 15 years ago. Yeah, we need more of that for sure. All right, next question. I have one from Francesco from Ithaca, New York. Excuse me, Ithaca, New York. They say, here's a strange and sexy question for you. Oh, so, okay. ready, everybody. I already like it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is there a game that you played a long time ago that you would like to play again and it left a mark on you, but you can't remember the name and you can't find it anywhere? I remember playing a PC game where you would destroy mechs and you would be able to go inside them and play as them. It was top down, and on the cover, there was a guy with shades or a helmet. So that was <laughs> Francesco's suggestion. I don't know what game he's talking about. I don't know if any of you guys can. It could be any number. That's like, that's like 2,000 games from the early <laughs> 90s PC era, really. I don't know. That's a tough one. There was, yeah, there was one like monster truck game, I remember. It's always something like that, isn't it? It's always like something that's so ubiquitous of the yeah. time and it wasn't monster truck madness that i used monster to play. jam might have been my yeah well no see that's i surely i would have picked up it, that's the problem though right is that maybe i didn't maybe i didn't check it out god going to mech it would even help to have the era you know um did they say pc at he least? said p he or she I said mean, pc i don't know wait, oh, are we supposed to be help. figuring out what this game is what well, is that our, our mission? The question, yeah. Or are we saying, are there games that we can't remember? But the question was, yeah, are there games that you played that you can't remember what it was okay. called and you'd love to go back to it? I played a, uh, I used to be, like a lot of people, into tycoon games and, you know, 
city building. There was a train. There was a the game. The entire game was set in like a sepia tone, like yellow. And <laughs> you were building a railroad across America. And you had to interact with the tycoons and like these like story moments. And you had to manage like people quitting their jobs. And, and I've looked at a lot of like train tycoon games on Google and I can't find the one. Um, it wasn't like Myers railroads. I don't think so. No, I've looked that one up. It wasn't like an expansion pack for transport tycoon. I don't know. I don't know. That was a weird one. Was it isometric? Hmm. Yes, yes, it was. Because Transport Tycoon is the one that always gets like forgotten about. No, it was not. Tra- I'm looking at it okay. right now. It was not Transport Tycoon. It was CPA. more like it was like f- sort of like on the era of like going away from the you know the pixel you know graphics going to like almost 3D. I remember again, it's just a weird blur in my mind, but I remember loving it. It was sepia tone. That's so. That's wild. And what console did you say? It was PC. Yeah. There's no way we can't find this. That's such a specific yeah. set of criteria. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's point. I don't, yeah, yeah. Uh, was that I Lionel mean, Train City Builder? No. Sepia Tone Train Sims, where you build a railroad across America. <laughs> Very specific, all right? Uh, they, were a, they were a dime a dozen, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I remember I have one where I think it was on the NES where you were playing as a ninja and you could turn into like a bird and like a, <laughs> I want to say a hawk or something. You could turn into different animals. I think there were three different animals you could turn into. Uh-huh. I think it was co-op. But I remember oh, me and my brother having a good time with one. that. We rented it and could never find it again after that. I don't remember what it's called. And I was telling my dad about it. I was like, yes, you did this and you're a ninja. And then for my birthday, he bought me like Shinobi 3. Ah, oh. which and I realized I was like, this isn't the right game. And I was all st- stinker about it. I was like, this is not <laughs> it. And then, you know, didn't realize it was probably a better game. <laughs> I actually have a good example because we this one was recently solved, but it just happened and I didn't know it. OK, but luckily, some creative folks on the Internet, uh, some stream goers found it for me because awesome. I was everyone wanted to know the story about how I got into manatees. OK, you know, I like ducks. <laughs> I like manatees. All right. Everyone wanted to know the manatee story. So it comes from this game that I didn't remember, which is actually called Undersea Adventure. It's a cult classic PC game where there's a talking manatee that teaches you about the ocean. (laughs) And it goes all the way back to that game. And I had no idea what the game was. I just remember there was an undersea maze with a talking manatee and other talking sea creatures that like, it's like, it's an interactive museum. Yeah. It's fully voiced. This game is is a killer ride. I'm telling you, you got to check this out. It's an awesome oh game. I just look up a screenshot of this and like <laughs> literally it's a picture of a manatee. Yeah. Yeah. He wow. was like, he would talk to you. This was when voice in games was becoming a big thing. He'd be like, hey, what's up, man? Let's go check out <laughs> sea creatures. And he would like teach you about sharks and piranhas and all kinds of other stuff. It was really an incredible game. Yeah, there he is. <laughs> um, and he was like your best friend growing up. Yeah, you got it, Reeves. But anyway, <laughs> this is one of those ones that I saw. It was like, man, it's kind of like, you know, Wolfenstein style going through this blocky kind of maze thing. But it's an interactive sea museum. <laughs> and we did track it down. Undersea Adventure. It's amazing. Check it out. <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I had one coming soon. on NES. And it was, I was like, it's like a Zelda game. But it was like, you're playing as this blue ball and you're solving puzzles, and there's enemies you're navigating, and it kind of looks like Bomberman. For the longest time, I could not figure this out, like, what it was, and, uh, you know, like, Googling stuff, you, you know, it, I just couldn't figure it out. It was The Adventures of Lolo. Does anybody remember that? I do remember that. Had, like, basically a ball with feet and that. eyes. Yeah, and that's it. I'm looking at but, it right now. Yeah, that's actually a pretty apt description. A, <laughs> it's such a fun little game, and, uh, yeah, it, it had sequels. It was on Game Boy. Like, this was a big series back then and just disappeared. But just a terrifying character. This is fu- <laughs> blue ball. I don't know. It's yeah, a weird thing. It almost looks like it would be at McDonald's. <laughs> don't you miss that era of just, like, like characters that are, that are just meaningless in form almost? Just Yeah. Like, yeah. Like cool spot or you know, Zool, like none of these things look Zool. like the thing they're supposed to look like. Like apparently yeah, that's like a ninja, right? Like it doesn't look like a ninja. <laughs> <laughs> or like, like a this... good one too is Vector Man. Remember that? It was just a bunch of like balls. Yeah. Like, 
<laughs> just a, really isn't a character at this yeah, point. Yeah, it's a tech a best come to life. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was that one? What was the what was a no? It wasn't body blows? What was the one where it was like Rise of the Robots? It was the it was the the two D fighting game where they were just three D models fighting each other. Yeah. But they just were just the most like uninspired robots. Yeah. Totally. Like one's a rectangle and one's like, yeah, this color. <laughs> that reminds me of another game. I, I don't, was it the one where you could rip each other's arms off and you could like attach new arms to your body? That it could have been. Robot? Sounds sounds about right. Man, I remember playing that game. I think that was on Genesis. I remember playing that a lot with the buddy. And we had a lot of fun with that one. Man, I can't remember what that one was called either. If you remember out there, you're listening to this and you remember what that game or any of these other games were called, right <laughs> in. I would love to know. <laughs> cool good Where question yeah let's see grant writes in he says happy friday y'all he has a little emoji of a thumbs up that was it that was the entire email oh so, thanks, <laughs> happy, happy, happy friday everyone yeah <laughs> matt from philly writes in says do you guys have any pc recommendations for playing games with my six-year-old it can be a co-op game or it can be a game where i do the parts or where he does all the playing i assume we beat Moving Out, Human Fall Flat, uh, Yoku, Yoku's Island Express. Was that what yeah. it's called? Yeah. I love that game. Yeah, that, that game's game the very pinball cool. Metroidvania game. It's yeah, so that good. game's cool. Yeah, I, I love that game too. And it's like fairly shortish. I think, what, 10 hours or something? He says they also played Sonic 2 and they've been playing Overcooked. So those mm. are some of the games we played, but open to other suggestions. I got the slam dunk. Before before Reiner gets it because it's such a good one and undersea adventures, no, I mean, <laughs> but but it's farm together. Farm together is like oh yeah, one of the best mad chill games. I mean, I'm an adult and I and I and I just love that that game is a Zen garden of the mind. Okay, yeah. no like, fail states, all progress. This is a game that <laughs> you continually make progress. Everything you do is a positive. I've never seen a game that does that. It's such a rewarding experience. I love it. Do you think it's better than Stardew Valley? Something like just playing Stardew Valley? Very different. You know, there's no story. This is just, you know, a simulation. There's no... But you could play, like, what, 12-player co-op? Yeah, you can have tons of people in your game. Wow. I have my friends over the farm, you know? They can all go fishing or, like, <laughs> hang out with the with the pets, you know, the cows or whatever they want to do. They're, I've, as Reiner said, it's not, like, it's one of the only few times I'm playing a game that I can actually turn my mind off from a min max perspective or an efficiency perspective yeah. i just don't care it's That's just cool. hanging out on the farm and having a good time it's it's really i i, I don't know how it does it there, there's no like incentive to be like oh man well, all right here's what we got to do we got to get ready for summer and plant all the trees over in this corner and make sure we're maximizing our crop efficiency like you would in another farming game even if you're doing it subconsciously sure. just, it's like hey that's a dumb cute animal and i'm just gonna go hang out with it <laughs> So are right. we looking for just PC games? He did say PC. Was, okay. Uh, I assume his preferred platform. Yeah, my yeah, daughter I gonna, is... Oh, I was just is, I was going to suggest Sackboy's Big Adventure, but that's not a PC game, so it doesn't really count. Yeah. yeah. My so daughter is playing a game credit called... Card. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Seriously, she did just put a note under my door. Oh, no. She's going for a walk with my dad, but it, I did find... It, it was right on my desk. I could show you guys. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's like changes color, and then like this kind of demonic. It's ominous. There. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like runic. Wait, that's a new one. That's a new no, one? no, no, no. That was the one where she <laughs> leveled up in Fortnite. Uh, but she's playing a game called Star Stable. It's a horse, like training, purchasing MMO experience. Oh okay. my gosh, I'm actually this. I'm I am writing this down for my wife. <laughs> What's it called again? Star Stable. I've never heard of this. Like her and her little online friend group are all about this. And oh, you know, every like once in a while they're like, the game? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And you could you could download the client or whatever, but it is a full on MMO. The world is populated with people. They keep updating it with new horses and quests and races a, and a horse MMO. Yeah, you should play it, Dan. I, I've got to check this out. <laughs> hey, wait, are you saying I don't have to be level 40 and have like a hundred <laughs> golds to get my horse? Well, you do. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, I, I do have a subscription to it. Kyle Hilliard, who used to be a Game Informer, uh, he and I, his daughter and my daughter play this together. Uh, and we both had a, a text conversation. It's like, well, there's this subscription thing. Should we do it? Or, you know, like give them all these points that they can spend on, you know, different saddles and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, so we both went in at the same time. So they had the equal experience. Yeah. 
Kyle well, also yeah, they, plays, they play that a lot. Kyle also plays Little Nightmares two with his daughter. So apparently that's a Whoa. good kid game. I don't know. <laughs> I don't. I don't. Rec- I don't know. <laughs> Maybe vet that one a little bit. I was just gonna say <laughs> even something like The Sims. I think could be a fun thing. Yeah. yeah. Where you play and like as an adult, I still enjoy The Sims. So I think a kid would really get into that. It was Grant, right? That's who wrote the email. Did he say how old was, his kid is? It was Matt. Matt. I think he said six year old. Six. I was wondering if like something like Deep Rock Galactic. That might be too advanced. I'm not sure. But like that dwarf mi- space mining game. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not sure about like, you know, the, the individual systems in there, like what sort of difficulty they might present. But that could be cool. I mean, you could do something like like a 2D platformer, like Rayman Legends. That's a really enjoyable oh, yeah. game. Rayman games. What yeah. about um? Am I the, again, it might be. I can't tell the dexterity of a six-year-old, but Spelunky. Me and my wife play like religiously. That Spelunky is Spelunky too. Um, you know, those earlier, or you can do that co-op, and the, you could also sort of like you're free to do your own thing, but also you can very much do it in a sort of a one of one person takes point. You know, yeah. sort of leads through kind of way. Yeah. Um, like Sonic the Hedgehog too. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> 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 Lastly, maybe like Ultimate Chicken Horse. Oh um, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Very simple, yeah. but you know. And and that's like creativity, like kids like building and stuff exactly. and playing it. Like, yeah, that seems cool. Is Scribble yeah. not on PC? Uh, it, it is. Uh, is, Scribble, is Scribble not unlimited? I think maybe. Oh, okay. That could be a fun one. Might be a fun learning experience too. Yeah. Yeah. Are six year olds able to spell? I see. I, I have an eight year old, but so. I, I don't know how to be oh, yeah. a parent to anything above where I am at the moment. Some I can. can. <laughs> <laughs> they're geniuses. Yeah. My niece and nephew are six and they're, I think, learning their alphabet now. Okay. That seems about right. So maybe in a couple of years, you can introduce scrib- scribble knots. But even just the idea of like, okay, here's a challenge. Like, what do I need to add that would, yeah. how do I cut down this tree? Like, what do I need? And the mm. cat could say I mean, yeah, especially the if you're there. Say, gu- the kid could say it and you would. Especially if you're playing it together, you can guide them through it. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. I like that. Dude, that horse game looks just like launch. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm Seriously. I mean, I, when they started playing it, I was like, whoa, this is a full on MMO. Like. And I was like, okay, we'll, we'll see how she handles it. But I was so worried it was going to be like, dad, what's this? Dad? You know, like I didn't yeah. want to be like there over her shoulder the whole time playing that with her. But no, they just took off and, you know, rode off okay. and away they went. Question. <laughs> nice. Amazing. Kids have a different tolerance for how things look too, I think. I remember yeah. as a kid thinking Thundercats looked really cool. And I don't know if you've <laughs> gone back to look at it now, but it's, <laughs> it doesn't hold up quite the same <laughs> as it did in my mind. Okay, next email. Jake from the internet writes in. He says, if you had to erase all of the art produced from one decade in the last 60 years, which would you choose? Ooh. I would personally choose the 80s because yep. I find so much 80s music cloying, especially the overused gate reverb on drums. I don't care a lot about 80s movies such as The Breakfast Club, Back to the Future, or The Shining. And I don't like pixel art because it's ugly and outmoded. So, all right, Jake. Wow, Jake. Oh, I, I feel yep. personally attacked by Jake right now. <laughs> I mean, 80s is a good pick. I would do 90s just to get rid of all of my awful writing back then. I don't. I would. I guess that's. It's, you, you said art. That that's art. not art. Well, how bad it is, it could be considered art. <laughs> well, so um, when did games become art? Because we can just like decide that maybe games became art in the 2000s. So that means we don't get rid of any of the games. Okay. Oh, that'd be interesting. Mm. There you go. Interesting yeah. loophole there. <laughs> so you would get rid of the 80s then? No strings. I like the 80s movies, though. I, I really like what Back to the Future and Breakfast Club and those 80s movies. So I think I, well, the 90s has what Jurassic Park, which is another personal favorite. Yeah, so you know what, era era just we've been alive or could we just like yeah, say goodbye to like 10 years. years of our parents' childhood? It said last 60 years. That's why I was thinking 70s. Okay. I don't think I have a huge affection for much in the 70s. <laughs> there weren't a lot of games to yeah. care about. Star so our love was over. It was just... You know, it was a downer. It was a downer decade. I guess you lose the what the first two Star Wars. Yeah, sure. Which is a bummer. And if you lose those, are we doing like the rule where like if the if those didn't exist and maybe the future? Yeah, oh, that's an interesting oh. question, actually. Yeah. My original answer was going to be the 1930s because, you know, there's nothing what? there. But Too far that's, back. that's 40s, past the threshold. Man, yeah. I don't know if you're uh, doing math right on that one. 
<laughs> well, yeah, I didn't realize it was 60 years. How about this loophole? You know, Hitman 3 will have to take a hit. You know, Bravely Default 2 might have to take one for the team. What if we just eliminate this year? It's a new decade and yeah. we save all of the other art. We're only a month and a half in. Well, 2020 is yeah. gone anyway, right? We, we still have Hitman 2, there. Hitman 1, you know. We can't even remove it because it didn't exist. <laughs> Does that mean we get no new art for the next nine years? Yeah, but think of your back catalog. Yeah. So many games you've not played yet. that are just sitting on your shelf. Like, sure, I'll take 10 years off to to finally get around to playing yeah. Blinter Sale 16. I can't Double think. agent. <laughs> Uh, that's an interesting choice. So it's like, is it almost better to like, I don't know what's coming. Well, no, you can't delete that, yeah. what's not here. Well, so we're, we're just getting rid of, you know, what's here in 2021. It says we're getting rid of one decade. All the art uh, produced in one decade. Hmm. That's fine. Well, I, I can't wait for all this coronavirus. Yeah, true. Yeah, we're gonna get yeah, for the yeah next true. Decade. All right. So yeah, I think I'd do the 80s. You know, we'd lose Mario and Zelda and stuff like that. But, you know. There was a lot of bad stuff going on in the eighties. Mm. What? <laughs> what about the movie Nine to Five? You're gonna give that up? Classic <laughs> art house. Yeah, mannequin. That was eighties, right? What about Bowie's depressing <laughs> period? <laughs> yeah, I think I'd personally re- rather get rid of the nineties. I don't know. Although, yeah, yeah might, Batman yeah. the animated series that'd be fun. Uh, Quake three is in the nineties, man. I can't do it. Uh, Sorry. That's true. All the formative like. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be yeah, hard too. Yeah, Metal Gear Solid. Seven. Metal Gear Solid. It'd be easier if we just picked years and made a decade of years our own assembled oh, decade. I could do that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Get rid of 2019. 20. 20. Yeah, 2020, 2020 is just immediately gone. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. 2000. Well, let's do that. Uh, we're going to use that loophole. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Let's see. We have an ever expanding list of uh, games that we are calling required reading. People are sending us in games and we're saying, hey, is this game, if you love games as an art form, you know, and you don't want to remove any of the decades of games, <laughs> is this a game that you think you should play as a okay. lover of the industry? So we're calling these our required reading. So we're trying to like pare down to an ultimate list. Maybe we'll go down to 10, but right now we're just ranking the nominees. We're just okay. filling in the nominees slots. So people are writing in, it's like, hey, do you think this should be nominated even? So maybe not necessarily required reading, but is it at least nominated? Okay. Does that make sense? Why isn't it just required playing? Because <laughs> RP doesn't sound as good. I don't know. <laughs> good. In your head, in your head canon, you can call it the uh, required. Playing. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so we have a couple of people who wrote in this week saying, hey, you guys should uh, consider these games. First one, Mitch from Houston. They write in Dark Souls should be required reading for any gamer. From Software practically created a genre that has been emulated by dozens since. The combination of intense challenge and incredible creature slash world design is only surpassed by the feeling of an accomplishment that comes when beating one of the grotesque grotesque monstrous bosses. As Dan Tack likes to say, anyone can beat this game if they're willing to persist, level up, and learn the mechanics. Dan, you're always saying that, right? I I have... Well, he quoted me, so yes. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys think? Dark Souls, is that required reading? No, what is... Re- okay, so... Oh, wait, I just thought of it. Should we call this required beating instead? Yeah, do they have to Do they have to complete the game? I don't think so, but do, should people try it? I would say most should, yes. Uh, is it going to mesh with everybody? No. But I think a lot of people who... As far as the emails that I get... Some people who are really afraid to try those games end up being the most, uh, end up being the, the staunchest advocates after they give it a whirl instead of being like, you know, scared to try it. If you, if you try it, you don't like it. Hey, no harm, no foul. That's cool. But, but um, yeah, I know everybody goes to the difficulty in them, but I just love how freeing those games are, right? Like you, you, you're just kind of placed in that world and you're just kind of figuring it out on your own. Yeah. You know, you get those clues from players that, you know, they could be griefing you or whatnot. But, uh, you know, you, you're really just kind of making progress on your own, checking out, you know, should I go left or right? You know, it's mm-hmm. you're you're not really on a path, even though you kind of are right. Like you're going from boss to boss to boss in most instances or finding those those doors that you got to get to. But, you know, kind of the path and techniques you take to get there 
you kind of feel clever in, in putting it together, right? Like how you, how you approach it. Yeah. Even, so in, I, even I really if, like that about this. Yeah. Even if, even if you're, it gives you the sense of that freedom, even if perhaps you know, the possibility space seems really big. Yeah. Yeah. Even, games. even if it isn't really right. It, it just feels different than other games in that capacity for some reason. It, it's so. funny how like those games are, and I, I really enjoy those games. Uh, like Dan said, it's kind of like they, they, they click with you or they don't. But I think if you're doing like a, if you're trying to look at them within this sort of broader scope of games, I don't necessarily think that they've been like that crazy influential outside of what From has done. But I think that they are a really interesting sort of like moment in game design where we had basically come from the like like 10 to 15 years of the opposite happening where games were becoming so um they were like placating players like they were becoming so accessible which i guess is important and more mainstream and stuff like that but to the point where like you were having these open world games where you you just the the game was trying to get out of the player's way as much as possible and just give them what the player wanted all the time and there would be no challenge and players for the most part were were happy with that and actually didn't like games that put barriers in front of them whereas what i think is cool about demon souls and probably dark souls more because it had that that was the sort of breakout moment is Mm -hmm. that it it reset the conversation with gamers and developers over that whole thing so i think that's where it's interesting where if you look like 20 years down the line where games are now getting hard again and people are saying that's a good thing or at least they understand the difficulty between games being difficult for the sake of it uh, and games being i don't know challenging or you know interesting in that way so yeah i can i can see it being nominated definitely it's in the conversation but i don't i don't find it to be this like game that changed everything it it changed one thing very yeah i think it made a big case for something that's very particular in game design or it kind of introduced a new wrinkle on things we've been playing for decades but just framed it in a different way that was really intriguing right and 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 just at the right time too you're you're totally right like you know everything was kind of getting handholdy like i was just playing call of duty the other day uh um the new one uh black ops cold war and i'm like three hours into the game and i get to a point where i have to duck and it tells me like hit me to duck and i was like i know <laughs> you've already told me this like 15 times you told me this <laughs> 20 years ago <laughs> yeah seriously uh, or follow this guy it's like i get it you know but this game here, it's it's very much just good luck, you know. Like, and I like that, you know. It, and Zelda: Breath of the Wild did that very well too. Just kind of like go forth, adventure, enjoy yourself. And and I I think they maybe took a little of that from Dark Souls. You know, I think there might be a little inspiration there that you know just we don't have to you know you know hold their hand the whole way. Sure. I mean, we're we're talking about Dark Souls here, obviously, but would Dark Souls be the game that you guys would nominate if it were up to you? Do you think you would go with Bloodborne or even Demon Souls if you had to pick one of these? I wouldn't, I wouldn't go with Demons. Demons is a different kind of thing. I, 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 the one I tell people to play right now if they want to play a Souls game first and not Bloodborne. Obviously, Bloodborne is the best thing ever made, ever. So, <laughs> um, but if they want to do a Souls game, then I say three, just because three is structured the cleanest everything is clean in that game all of the nascent energies have coalesced into a a very clean product that is uh it's the easiest one to get into it it works in a you know in a a fashion where it's not like you know bloodborne the first level in bloodborne is the hardest level and maybe that is not the right way to get someone into the game uh but dark souls 3 moves along a more traditional like it's a stair you climb of difficulty does it it reaches certainly reaches the peaks and the apexes of Dark Souls difficulty and challenge, but it does so in a way that the player can dip their toes in the pool before they start swimming in the deep end. Instead of Bloodborne, where it's like, hey man, I don't know if you can get past these werewolves, but we're not going to tell you anything. Good luck. <laughs> and then we're never going to give you a really hard boss, too. Have fun. <laughs> you know? And then it's like, but if you get past that, you're okay. But we're just, you know, and that has always puzzled me about that game. But Again, if if not Bloodborne, then DS3. And I know people always like to play the games in order or whatever, but the other games, uh, you know, and it's cool. It's okay. It's okay to like, you know, let the player discover and make mistakes, but it can be a big turnoff to go into Dark Souls for your first time and just be like, all right, uh, where do I go? Oh, there's a cemetery over here. I'm going to check this out. And then a skeleton just oh. tears you in half and you're like, okay, well, maybe this isn't my game. <laughs> because the player been, you know, there's some conditioning aspect here, right? 
the player is like, well, that's where I have to go. That's the enemy I have to beat. Maybe I'll try that again. And they won't go somewhere else where they're yeah. supposed to go. And they're going to keep beating their head against that skeleton. And one player is going to come out of that a really hardcore skeleton murderer. And he's going to know <laughs> the ins and outs of every block parry and, and, and skeleton action out there. And the other player is going to be like, I'm going to go play something else. So I hate skeletons. <laughs> It sure. is surprising how conditioned you can be to doing that wrong thing and not think about something else. I remember my 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 embarrassing uh, Dark Souls story is I played Bloodborne before. That was like the first game that introduced me to everything. I made my way sort of backwards or front to back then through them. Um, but I didn't realize that you could just use a shield. I thought you had to parry in Dark Souls 1 as well. <laughs> so all I was doing was parrying skeletons. So I was like, man, this game is hard. But I got really good at parrying skeletons. Yeah. And then like, you know, three hours in or something, I just held the button and, he, and I was like, oh, God. <laughs> like, but yeah, amazing. I, you know, it's so silly. Yeah, well, just do. for context here, some of the other nominees we already have on our nominee list are what, Chrono Trigger, Diablo 2, Doom from 1993, the Legend of Zelda Link to the Past. Do you guys think Dark Souls hangs with that? Yeah, right now, I think I think it's different enough to warrant the discussion. Like once you start filling out that 10, it might be one of the first that goes. But I don't know, you know, Chrono Trigger, I, I, that's a place in time and great game and great writing. But I don't I don't know if that's going to hold up either. Yeah, this isn't just like a, a list of 10 out of 10s, right? So this I think I think Dark Souls fits very nicely on a the coffee table of games that you should experience kind of thing. Sure. But yeah, those big beats, they happen less frequently the longer we go, right? Like the, a lot of yeah. early ones, obviously, when we went into 3D and started yeah. making home consoles. So yeah, when you think about some of the big beats in the past 10 years, it definitely hangs. Yeah, well, yeah, one example I always have been citing is the original Tomb Raider. Obviously super influential, super popular at the time. I really loved it back when I first played it. I don't think I would put it on this list just because like it does not hold up at all. It is super rough and hard to go back to. And I don't think you need to play it these days to understand. Right. Yeah, but you can lock that butler in the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Somebody write in. <laughs> uh, well, hey, to go full circle, Danny, let, let's just bring up one more. Should Half-Life Alex be considered for this as the VR staple see that runs into early. the same problem as chrono trigger right which dark souls almost did as well which is that it's a very particular like like half-life alex is probably going to be the opposite of what this list is because half-life alex is going to be the exception to the rule because we've all been talking to you know the killer app that vr needed I and mean, it needs one great game and the rest will come yeah. and like that was it man and like yeah there it's it is. not going to come, probably. You know, maybe yeah. VR will continue. VR seems to be just its own little pocket, right? And maybe it's a market that's big enough to sustain itself, but that mass, mass mainstream thing, it just doesn't seem to want to materialize. And Half-Life Alex is a game that almost sort of shouldn't exist. I'm delighted yeah, to die. Yeah, you're totally right. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's such a strange one. It's a novelty, oh, yeah. you know? That goes in the list of odd job games with like, <laughs> that shouldn't exist, like Seaman and, oh, you God. know. Who knows oh, what gosh. else? I haven't thought about seeing it in a while. <laughs> yeah, uh, I loved Half Life Alex, and if you had the opportunity to play it, I would say definitely do play it. So good yeah. for sure. Well, we do have one more that somebody wrote in. Joshua from New York wrote in, said, "Long time listener, first time writing in. I was listening to the podcast last week when you brought up the idea of uh, required reading, and I really wanted to write in about it. So here we go. Resident Evil Four. Not only is it considered one of the greatest games of all time by many." but also much like how the first game in the series set the standard for how survival horror should be, RE4 set the standard for all third-person action games and video games to come. Before our Resident Evil 4, every third-person action game had to be played with shooter controls that just felt clunky and imprecise. I mean, this is uh, Joshua saying this, so it's an opinion. Uh, and they says uh, the camera was pulled too far back and the aiming was usually automatic or non-existent. The impact Resident Evil 4 had on the industry is undeniable. For that reason, it should garner a spot on this required reading list. What do you guys think? All right, I'm going to be the bad guy and just say it doesn't have to be on the list. I think, it did. I think it's a great game. Um, I like that game a lot, but I don't think it's a game you have to play today. Yeah, I agree. I think it's 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 one of those games where because I was trying to think of other games that might exist post 
millennium and it, like world of warcraft comes to mind but then when you think about wow it's like wow also wow was also the game that did all these things right in a way that like resi 4 kind of did too like it you know it fixed a lot of console specific problems with those types of games and and it, you know but it's also like if you go back and play it it's not the cleanest experience i like it's still got its own resident evil jank which i think is great and it it doesn't take away from it being a really good game but i don't know if it had that big an influence and in, in that it like changed the direction it just was the first one that kind of got it right and then everyone else aped that and we had like you know 10 years of third person action games with cover mechanics and whatnot um but yeah i kind of agree i tend to agree with dan it, it doesn't doesn't have that special sauce. So I don't want to take away from Resident Evil 4 at all, you know. But Yeah, and, and, you know, it's weird because I think it's probably the best Resident Evil game, you know, a 10 out of 10 in, in my opinion. And, you know, the intensity it delivered just in a moment of you standing still, just trying to line up a little red dot on a slowly <laughs> shuffling zombie, that exchange uh, was just brilliant. But if I want to recommend a Resident Evil game to someone, I think I would go with two or maybe even one on GameCube to really just understand, you know, the remake, yeah. you know, uh, talking about both to, remakes, I assume. Yeah. yeah. To understand really the, the special sauce, the flavor of that series. I think those early ones, those first three games speak more to what Res evil is than four, even though that's the best playing and mm. evolved the game, uh, or that series, I think one, two, and three are, have more of a special place in my heart. And I think, those might have a better chance of being on that list. And I don't even think they get on there. Um, that's just kind of my take on that. Yeah, I guess I'm surprised. I thought more people would be for this. Uh, I think I'd probably be for it, but I'm a big Resident Evil fan. And just to kind of go back to like it doing a lot of the things right, like you didn't see a lot of shooters coming out of Japan back then. Like that was kind of rare to have, you know, and you can kind of see that where they were where they were hesitant to let you move and shoot at the same time. That wasn't a thing that they were like, ah, is that fun? But so it was interesting to see that experimented with. And I don't think you get a game like Resident Evil 4 from an American studio. Uh, no. Back then, for sure. Not with all the like, because it still had all the, the beauty of Resi, which was like item management and scarcity and like, which was the opposite of shooters, right? Shooters was... Yeah. Unlimited ammo and yeah, waves. Go to town. Feet. Yeah, totally. And, and it kind of was after, you know, Gears of War continued. It's it still, in many ways, is kind of a, a unique little butterfly. But I don't know. It feels like its influence, the further we get from it, feels like it wanes, actually. But it definitely was a big moment in, in time, which makes Resi 5 even crazier. <laughs> Yeah, it really opened the door for horror, even though it was kind of a campy horror, right? Like jump scares, stuff like that, that, you know, that first game. Um, that really kind of set the stage for a whole different genre yeah. that I don't even think it's a part of anymore. I guess seven kind of gets back there. But um, yeah, they kind of had their own, you know, footing in the industry, which was was kind of interesting. Yeah, it's cool. All right. So I guess we're all no then on Resident Evil 4? I don't think so. Uh, yeah, You guys got to get some emails it. this week. <laughs> no, I think we're, we're, all, used to it. we're all very clear we all hate Resident Evil 4 right that's, yeah. that's what we're saying yeah yeah I, I obviously love that game but yeah I, guess, I think the uh, Tomb Raider analogy kind of fits here of like mm -hmm. if you go back and play Resident Evil 4 now you're going to be like well I've played this better in dozens of other games since mm -hmm. but the fact is it was novel at the time which you can't replicate today unfortunately yeah. cool well that closes out the email section of the show. If you want to send us an email, you know, suggest a game that should go on our rec recommended reading or recommended playing. I don't know what it's called anymore. Send <laughs> <laughs> that in. Podcastgameinformer.com. We'll take those. Any other questions you want to ask? Really, really appreciate it. Please send those in. That brings us to the next segment of the show, the segment we like to call Dan. Get wrecked. That's right. We like to call it Get Wrecked. Dan, do you have anything to recommend? I sure do. Uh, let's see. If you want to get wrecked at GameInformer.com today, which you should, uh, I got a ton of BlizzCon stuff up. You should check it out. Uh, lots of announcements. I, you know, digital event this year, but still lots of amazing stuff coming, especially D2 re, uh, Remaster, which I'm super, super stoked about. Uh, check it out. Also, uh, some new, again, tons of Valheim stuff and some stuff on that new other game we talked about. So there's just crazy content. Check it out. Get wrecked. Awesome. Alex, what about you? Yeah, I'm going to recommend Marcus Stewart's Ranking Mortal Kombat's on-screen adaptations. 
Very fun feature. Uh, there's a lot more on-screen Mortal Kombat things than I realized. Uh, so very cool article. And then keep an eye out on our YouTube channel over the next couple of days. I've got a, a video essay I've been working very hard on. It's going to be my first one I'm dropping uh, for Game Inform. I'm very excited. Uh, yeah, stay tuned there. All right, cool. What about you, Reiner? Oh, boy. Just uh, all the latest reviews. You know, if you're looking for, for new games to play, uh, you know, it seems like it's been a slow year, but there's there's been some good games that have been dropping. So, you know, we, we mentioned a couple of them here, but check out our review landing page and, and see what's out there. Sure. See what fits. I thought you might highlight, you did a feature recently, the best and worst Pokemon collectibles that money can buy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that recommends people look at it. because That was, yeah, a, a good use of my time. As, Give me a taste. <laughs> a taste. What's, what's, what's one of the worst ones? Uh oh, there's one that's like aliens. And, yeah, Pikachu like, is an alien, like a hybrid. So picture the slimy, up. gross, weird, uh, alien body. The like a, like an HR Giger Geiger one. Giger yeah, one. yeah, Geiger like, okay. Giger, but Pikachu with that the sounds... teeth and yeah, it's that's the thing you could buy. We'll send you yeah. one. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, like Snorlax Pez dispensers or something. Um, I'm always <laughs> I, in the market. They're actually I probably guess... worth a lot. Oh, probably. I'm Someone sure. Collects those. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. There's also some cool stuff in there, like the Snorlax bean bag. That's just oh. human-sized Snorlax, which I definitely yeah. want. And it's, it's probably perfect. Really it's a perfect product. Yeah. He's just that's, smiling that's... at you to take a nap. He's <laughs> big enough to allow you to do it. It's great. So check that out on the site. Best and worst Pokemon collectibles. Danny, do you have anything you want to recommend to people from your own personal channels? How should people follow you? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Just if you type no clip into um, Google. You'll, you'll hit us eventually no clip documentaries over on youtube um yeah we're working on stuff but the nature of our work is that we're always sort of uh hush hush until stuff is done but uh we've got a couple of games 2020 that we were working on uh documentaries for uh and then we have like a four and a half year back catalog of uh of stuff including our six part episode on the development of hades which covers you know two and a half years of that game getting made it's about four hours long now um uh and then yeah any the, if you go to the channel there's probably a game we've covered at some stage and done a documentary on that you'd like, like Doom, Hitman, Horizon, Final Fantasy XIV, Rocket League, you know, just keep going. Outer Wilds, Outer Worlds, we did both just to make sure somebody <laughs> like, cover all the things. wrong one that. that we could send them to the other one. Yeah. You made up a third one for people to get. <laughs> <laughs> I would yeah. say all your Bethesda stuff, you know, uh, getting in the studio at Bethesda headquarters is amazing. You're a talent, so Danny. Much. You are a talent. Like you're keep too, up the good work. You're too kind. I, it's like there were very few people doing this type of stuff, but like you guys were absolutely like one of the few who was getting that opportunity to go into studios and actually like talk to people that way, where they were bringing you in and you were part of the conversation and they were able to open up a bit more, you know, as opposed to just a general press event type thing. Um, so it was cool to do it. That was the most fun thing about that was that I lived in Maryland for two years. So I was about 30 minutes from their studio. Hmm. So we filmed that we were there for like a week because we just kept, we came every day um, and did the whole thing. And yeah, so we, we did two docs that time. We did a like a 90 minute history of Bethesda video, which kind of breaks down everything from arena up until I guess 76. And then we did a documentary on Fallout 76 before Fallout 76 came out, before it was announced, actually, which has yeah. uh, it's aged kind of a situation. It hasn't, it hasn't aged particularly well, <laughs> shall we say. But if you want a snapshot in time of where that team was, uh, it's probably the only one you can get. Um, that had to be exciting at the time, though. You're like, oh, this is oh, a yeah. new Apollo game. Like, this is incredible. Like, yeah, it was super cool. And they were very optimistic and positive about the whole thing and it was like a cross studio collaboration like there was a lot of a lot of fingers on the pie which is why it was so interesting when it came out and people kind of felt that it was half baked because the furthest couldn't have been the the truth it's weird right and you guys probably don't get this a lot when it comes to studios there's like certain studios that people are like out to get and there are certain studios that people are really defensive about and sometimes those things are, you can kind of see it. And sometimes they don't really align. And one of the things that I got from visiting Bethesda Game Studios in Maryland, that's sort of Todd Howard's, the base that's there that does all the Elder Scrolls games. Um, they, they have the highest average tenure I have ever seen at a studio. I think it's like 17 years or something. It is absurd. Like people stay there. And people they like they can't leave. That's that's what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 like, it's, it's like the opposite. It's like people have had 
you know, there's people with like ki- kids, big families who like moved into a, that part. You know, it's it's not like the cheapest place, to, but people stay. And like, what does that tell you about a studio? You know, for for the amount of guff that Bethesda tend to get, they're one of those studios from my perspective at least that really takes care of their people which isn't always the case because some of the most popular games in the world are made under you know much much harsher conditions so that's why i kind of feel like i'm a little sometimes i'm a little bit protective of just how much backlash bethesda specifically teams tend to get because when i was there they actually seemed like one of the more responsible and affable uh, studios one that's not out to make a bunch of money as much as some of the other ones because also they were one of the only like independent they were like the biggest independent studio up until microsoft bought them right so yeah and making you know. some of the biggest games out there you know yeah. as a small team and then also small teams dude it's like skyrim is made with like fewer than 100 people it was like 80 people or something it's, like it, it's crazy and yeah. then also taking big chances you know going into the online space with fallout you know like yeah. this is something new for them and sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't you know yeah they've uh, had like a sort of a, a, a rough run i think in yeah. recent years and some of the other satellite studios have had great like arcane have done fantastic stuff in recent years it of course have had a f- amazing couple of years um yeah. so yeah i oh, think i think they're sort of like yeah i think they need to like having like a nice a nice win that would probably do them well um what's next we'll Star- starfield Star- starfield yeah starfield was yeah. in was in post was in pre-production when we were there and that was three years ago and elder scrolls was basically only announced at that e3 because they were announcing 76 and they wanted people to know that at least they were working on stuff but elder scrolls 6 was i think a dream and todd howard's todd howard's brain back when they announced it at e3 i don't think they had much done on it at all um but starfield i think is yeah hopefully we'll get it i don't know maybe next year we'll yeah, see maybe we'll hear more about this year that'd be cool. yeah fingers crossed we'll see well danny thanks for being on the show really appreciate it my pleasure. Thank you for having Come me. Come back anytime. Yeah, no problem. And thank you out there for watching and listening to this episode. Please like and subscribe or subscribe to the magazine. But whatever you do, come back next week where we'll have another episode for you. Until then, everybody, game on. Bye.